Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. It's nice to, nice to be asked to come and talk to you. Yeah, so just to give people a, an understanding of, of your experience. So you're a best-selling author. You're recognised in the top 100 most influential people in Dubai, which is some pretty influential people in Dubai. You know business and you recognise business opportunities. One huge example of that is you bought a business for $150,000 and it's now valued at $100 million. That's a huge achievement. You have a hugely successful podcast all about business, finances and life. And you are the creator of the Make It Happen University where you share your secrets to sales success. And that's what we're going to talk about today is sales success and business, which I love talking about business and I can talk about it for days, weeks, months and yeah, love it. So can't wait to hear all of your, you know, your advice and your tips and tricks. So first of all, I would love to know how you bought a business for $150,000 and turned it into a, a business worth $100 million. Okay, yeah, it's not, it sounds quite simple, doesn't it? But it, it does. Like <laughs> what actually happened is um, I, I own a company called the Blue Sky Thinking Group. That's a group of companies, and we include insurance broking and wealth management in there. And one day we had, uh, so we we're in a licensed insurance broker in Dubai, and I think there's 79 licenses here. And one day two guys came into the office with a piece of software, and they said, look, we've got this software. We want to monetize it. We can't monetize it without uh, having an insurance broker in license. So we're looking to do a JV. And so I listened to what they had to say, and I said to them, well, why, why don't you go and speak to the other companies? They said, we've spoken to every other company. Everyone said no. And I'm like, so first of all, I'm offended. I'm like, well, I'm the last person you'd speak to. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but then um, what most people didn't said no to was the fact they didn't understand the software. And it was a HR administration management tool, cloud-based tool that uh, enabled companies in the SME space to run their HR more efficiently rather than using Excel spreadsheets, which most of them do. And so we decided to get involved and Danielle, my business partner, she, she's way smarter than me. And she said, this is a good opportunity. And so we did a, a, a deal where we bought some of the equity in the business on the condition that the guys that, that developed the software stayed within the business, but within three months they were bored and off to the next thing. And so we bought the rest of the company from them and it was you know, 130, 150, I can't remember, but not a lot of money at all. Um, and then we decided to go and build that software out and allow that software initially to be a lead generation tool, in, fa in fairness, to medical insurance and other corporate insurances we offered. Um, and what it started to be was so much more than that. It started to be very valuable. There's a huge amount of important data on there that we know about companies, employees, salaries. You know, we can we can work with recruitment industries um, and help them understand what the average salaries are across a number of different functions. We understand um, medical insurance requirements and other types of gratuity schemes, company pension schemes, etc. Um, and we just put a lot of time into it and uh, realized that we had something very special. And there was another company in America called Zenefit that did something very similar and Zenefits if you go and look look in the, the the archives you'll learn that Zenefits was the fastest growing startup in Silicon Valley ever and uh, they were quickly worth 3.4 billion or something outrageous doing something very similar but obviously the states is a, a much bigger country than the United Arab Emirates mm. um, and so we kind of looked at their model looked at the things they did well and they did badly and then decided to go about it ourselves and we'd never been involved in it in software or anything like that before it was um it was a a, a a fluke i would say from getting introduced and then a commitment uh to making something of it and not in a million not in a million years did we think beyond our wildest dreams that it would grow to be as valuable as that that quickly um but it has done and it's um you know uh, very much respected it's called Benepool the software and it's an anagram of benefits and people and so you can you can find it online but it's specifically for the Middle East. Wow and so how long did it take you to do all of that like from from the minute you you sort of the you know sort of found these people to to now how long has that been? Five years. Wow wow and so is that a skill that you've got that you recognize business opportunities like that? 
Um, I, I recognize opportunities because I'm the ever, ever the optimist. So I see stuff. And as a salesman myself, I get sold on stuff very quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, you can you can sell me on, a, on, a, on, a, on an idea very quickly. I buy into it. I get enthusiastic about it. But luckily, I've got a group of people around me that are very conservative, very cautious, very analytical and data driven. Uh, and because of that, we do all of these checks before we say yes to anything. And um, and whenever we look at opportunities, we uh, you know, I, I'll get excited. You'll, you'll, the conversation will be in the car, Danielle, my business partner on the phone to me. And I'll be like, Danny, 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 I met this guy today. And they, this guy's doing this and this guy's doing that. We could do this and we could do that. And she was like, oh, that sounds fantastic. Really interesting. And I'm like, so right, we need to get an NDA sign. We need to do that. And be like, whoa, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Let me do a bit of research. And, um, and so that's how it works. And if you ask my PA, it's quite interesting. My PA, Sarah, has been with me 15 years, just like Danny has. And Sarah... Sarah has a, a, a three strike rule with me. She says, if you ask me to do something important, I listen to you. If you ask me to do it twice, I know you're taking it seriously. But if you ask me to do it three times, that's when I action it because ah. you're so enthusiastic about lots of things. And so we just need to make sure that you stay on the straight and narrow. So if it sticks, she knows it's something. If it sticks in yeah. your mind, then it's something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So now I want to talk about real estate businesses. So that's that's kind of the, the people in my Let's Talk About Real Estate group. So how does the principle of a real estate business first assess what's happening in their business to increase the performance of their staff? What's the best way to, to sort of, you know, come in and, and assess everything? What, what do you do when you look at someone's business? So I think the first thing to remember is anybody that owns a business gets very emotional about their own business. They've probably got their house on the line or they've got some, you know, big commitments and, and, and investment into it. And so you can't always be objective. And the difference with me and them is that I can look from a helicopter point of view and look down and see it for what it really is. Okay. And the, the, the problem with real estate businesses on the whole is they're actually not, not really worth very much because they're essentially middlemen. You know, they find a buyer, they find a seller, they sell a property and they own a commission. And so in terms of property management, there's renewable income. But in other areas, it's really kind of like a, a one hit sale and a one bit of commission. Mm -hmm. So I get businesses to start looking at that and being more honest about that and really understanding that their business itself is about the people and really being aware of the strengths and the weaknesses of people doing, you know, analytical analysis of people that work within their business rather than, well, he's a really good bloke and she's a really good person, you know. Um, and also, uh, I look very much into culture, understanding a culture of success. And a lot of businesses that have a turnover of salespeople which real estate tends to have um, to you have to be acutely aware of the culture and the culture of success because we all know about that guy that's mr negative that goes outside as a cigarette stands at the back of the building and is busy negging somebody else out or over lunch and stuff and so it's important to understand the impact people like that have on your business even people yeah. that write business yeah. um and it's also really important to understand in business if you're in the real estate sector to understand the, the importance of brand um, and really take that seriously rather than just, you know, what you call it, um, property portal leads and sales, which seems to be what a lot of people focus on. Um, because if they build a strong brand and that strong brand is attractive for the right type of people to want to work for it, rather than any old Tom, Dick or Harry that might want to sell houses, apartments or be in the rental market. Yeah, definitely. All right. So what are some examples of systems that you put in place for business owners and salespeople? If you were to come into a business, what are some of the things that you like the must that, that they have that they should have? So for, for me, um, opinions are irrelevant. Data is everything. So when it comes to understanding a business and the system they put in place, it's really important to understand that data tells the truth. Um, and to come away from what our, our thoughts and our ideas are and stay looking at the absolute truth, which is the data. So for me, an effective CRM system uh, is really, really important that is gathering the right kind of data that everyone agrees should be read and analyzed and should lead the company forward in its decision making. The next thing I do is look very heavily at the structured training that the sales management have, because a lot of the time I see salespeople, real estate brokers, whatever you want to call them, they get promoted up to another role a management role a leadership role because they've been a successful real estate broker well a real successful real estate broker doesn't make a successful man manager okay. so what structure is in place to train what structure is in place to 
uh, to measure and what structure is in place really to monitor everything that's going on. And a lot of leaders don't have that in place. They're just looking at, you know, how many sales did you make this month? How much commission did you generate? Rather than identifying other characteristics and traits that people people need in business and in real estate in particular in this example. So um, it's get, getting a really structured level of training. And I see this through, you know, there's, 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 thousands of real estate brokerages here in the UAE. This is one of the most densely populated in, uh, cities for, really? um, for real estate brokers. Okay. I think there's 6,000 real estate brokers in this city or country, sorry. There's 9.7 million population. It's insane. Every, every other person's a real estate broker. So really getting a, a good understanding of those, those people that work in that industry. And really when you, when you think about it and, 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 and you look at real estate as a whole, it's, it's, you know what, it's, it's a really interesting subject matter because it's one of five asset classes. And I find this quite fascinating. You know, that when you're selling a real estate project, whether that's an off-plan property, whether that's a finished unit, a secondary property, a secondary market property, people are seeing it as investment. Um, people think they know about real estate. You know, the general public think they understand it because they live in a house or, or whatever it may be. And so they think they're an expert at it, but they're not experts at the other four asset classes. So they shy away from it. So it's a really getting a, a good handle on not only educating your employees and teaching them systems and processes but also really getting a good handle on, on understanding your market and really understanding that market and looking at what value you can bring to the market mm, awesome okay now you've seen my skills on social media like facebook lives and you know like how quickly i can do it right so i wanted to ask you some tips on your social media because you've you've gone really well with youtube and, and all that sort of thing and, and youtube is hard to crack i think it is it, it is something you've got to be really persistent with but just want to know how have you built a name for yourself online well I, re I was one of these old fashioned dudes, you know, a few years ago that sat there going, well, it's just for the kids, isn't it? You know, it's not relevant to me. Um, and I, and what was, I made my first video, I think, um, it must be about five years ago, uh, no, 2016. So yeah, nearly five years ago. And I made my first video and I, I remember doing it. I had uh, my phone uh, stuck against the window in the office, which had some light on my face. And I created this video and I was like, well, that's a little rubbish. And then I went into a meeting room and I put the phone and uh, put the phone on the desk, you know, resting down and, and filmed myself. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good one. And uh, I look back at it now and it's just shocking. It's absolutely <laughs> shocking. It's the, the camera's looking right up my nose. Okay. <laughs> there's an echoey room in there and I'm like oh well good morning it's you know it's 7 a.m here in Dubai and I'm like what a load of nonsense what was I thinking but I think you have to to be good on social media you have to be committed to it and you have to be committed to learn and grow you know I went to a tv studio to go and learn you know to stand in front of a camera and get good at it I did a okay. two-day course because I wanted I wanted to know you know what you needed to do to be good and so I was prepared to invest in myself to learn those skills mm -hmm. and so um, I think that the reason that people like my stuff is that I'm really consistent, number one. So I'm, I'm putting content out very consistently. I understand there's different tools you can use in terms of you can write, you can video, you can audio, you know, you can do, you know, just fixed images and stuff. Um, and so I realized that I needed to test all of these things and saw, mm -hmm. see what worked best in different areas. Um, LinkedIn's a really strong uh, platform for me and it's where, where a lot of my uh, business uh, opportunities come from, from a training point of view. I don't mm -hmm. do any uh, outbound sales lead generation. All of my leads come to me because of the content I produce online. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and again, when you look at LinkedIn uh, and you compare LinkedIn to Instagram and Facebook, Facebook and Instagram are a pay to play model now they're not they're not they weren't before but they are now so if you want to grow an audience there you can't just produce content you've got to spend money on ads to yes. get get that content out to people I mean I think there's 60,000 people on Facebook that follow me or something like that and I know for sure that only a small percentage see my content and so mm. Facebook want to charge me to give act uh, to get me access to my own audience which drives me nuts you know when you think about it and you think of the early days of Facebook Coca-Cola went out and built a massive audience thinking that audience would belong to them for their marketing purposes and advertising and Facebook are like that nah yeah. you know we'll give you some but not all of them you have to pay to speak to them all yeah. so learning that understanding that there's other platforms out there that are interesting you know TikTok's becoming really interesting now and this you know people say again it was for the kids and you're right I know. first time I heard about it was my daughter's but yeah. 
TikTok's becoming important. Um, yes. But it's just, if you're going to produce content, produce content that's valuable, okay, and also ask people's opinions. Mm -hmm. Don't just sit there in your own head and in your own space making content thinking it's great. Not everyone wants to, you know, everyone likes the sound of your own voice. Not everyone likes your approach. Not everyone wants to see videos of houses. People like to see you document your life. People like to identify with people that have struggled like them too. So mm. if you've got challenges and your back's been against the wall, that stuff is gold. You know, mm. if you're a real estate broker that's just starting and you're new to the industry, you should be making content about not knowing what you're doing. Mm. Okay. You should literally be making content saying, I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. This is the first day on my job. Here we go. I'm going to learn because people will like, really identify and lean into that rather than the guy in the slick suit thinking his shit doesn't stink and he's the best thing since sliced oh. bread. Okay. Producing yeah. stuff that's somewhat, um, condescending maybe sometimes and uh, uh, uh and not just not very interesting mm. and remember you know you think about what you watch on tv and what you consume online think about that think about what you're watching and what you're looking at are you being entertained is that are you education what is it that you look at because other people think the same and they'll just as easily swipe past your stuff if it isn't very good so take some time be honest with yourself do some do some study learn okay and then commit to it so i'm doing it i'm committed i'm in mm -hmm. and what you'll see from me is there's content that goes up every day of the week um, we plan it we organize it and i'm in a fortunate position where i have a team now but i didn't at first not for the first couple of years it was me with my phone fidgeting around with a tripod trying to get a microphone to work sitting in a room thinking there's enough light then not trying to get dropbox to work with my videos i'm making on my phone and so on and such forth and trying to put videos onto Facebook Live and stuff like that. Ugh. Just like that. Just oh, like that. I've been in your shoes like you were this morning a thousand times. <laughs> so I feel so your much. pain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so the main ones you focus on uh, business to business. So you've done LinkedIn. You focus on LinkedIn and YouTube. They're the main. And you've got your podcast as well, obviously. So are they the three three things that you mainly yeah. focus on? Yeah, I do. The best. I would advise everybody to have a podcast. It's the best um, strategy, I think, right now to building an audience that you own. Because when people subscribe to your podcast, they would always get the next episode of your podcast pinged to their phone. Mm. And because they will always do it, you know that however many subscribers you've got, they all are getting it. Now, they may not all watch or listen, but they're all getting it. And a podcast is a great place to prospect as well. You can you can interview some phenomenal people. There's people that you want to do business with. I mean, if I want to do business with the CEO of a company, I just invite him onto my podcast. I've got oh. an hour's worth of interview. I've got 15 minutes to get to know him before. And he's told his life story and shared some tips and some strategies. His phone number's now in my phone. A week later, I call him and say, whatever his name is, let's say it's John. Hey, John, loved you on the podcast last week. The episode's coming out soon. Love to buy you a coffee and brainstorm a few ideas. Is I've got that I think can help your business and automatically they say yes and so awesome. very well, interesting. well you've had um, Grant Cardone he's a friend of yours isn't he and you've got Tony Robbins yeah you've had some pretty big people on your podcast so yeah oh, that's that's a great tip okay and and so how have you built up your following on YouTube though just from consistency um like how are you promoting it on, making, on LinkedIn yeah, making mistakes I am um, uh, uh, my, again, getting the content right, understanding, you know, thumbnails, understanding, you know, whether people want to watch long form content or short form content and, and just mm -hmm. kind of trying different things. I mean, my audience on, on YouTube isn't huge, um, but it's growing. Um, and I noticed that, you know, you have to have subtitles because not everybody's got the sound on. So you've mm -hmm. got to be aware that not everyone's got the sound on. And again, at first I didn't do that. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, so and, and and also I find that that people engage with you far more if you if you're if you throw some humor in there. Mm. And so again, I do that quite a lot as well. You'll find videos online on YouTube of me, you know, having a, a good laugh as well as the ones where I'm very serious. Yes. Um, but look, I'm no master of this. I really am not. I mean, my total mm. audience is about 140, 150,000 people. It's not, it's not huge. Oh, no, not huge at all. No. Well, <laughs> there are many more. And so yeah. th th that's across my channels. And so it, 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 it by far isn't anywhere near big enough. 
yeah. um, uh, to be the right type of audience. So it's the right type of audience, but not big enough to give me the type of global uh, uh, exposure that I want. But it is an engaged audience. And I think that's yeah. important to remember. You know, you must have an engaged audience and, and just having numbers and paying for followers is a, is a false economy. Yeah. It will just cost you money and it will cause you reputation issues in the future too. Yeah, definitely. So you're going to go on TikTok, start dancing or something like that? I'm on TikTok. Are you? Oh, cool. All right. I'll have to have, to have a look. I'm part of the TikTok education part platform. So oh, okay. um, I, I, my videos on TikTok are longer than one minute because I upload through a different system to what most people do because mm -hmm. TikTok have gotten a, a drive to push uh, education for people. Oh, okay. Awesome. All right. Now you've got eight eBooks on your website that people can subscribe to and I've put the links everywhere. So can you give us the quick rundown on each of each of the books? How do you stay motivated? <laughs> yeah, no? I don't oh, they got to download it. Books. <laughs> Sorry, you haven't read them. No, what you say? <laughs> no, I'm joking. I don't, know the I don't know the titles. If you give me the titles, I can tell you what they're about, I hope. <laughs> well, how to stay motivated? How do you stay motivated? Okay, so, so, so and it, there's an easy way and a difficult way to stay motivated. The difficult way is to think of long-term goals and try and achieve them. That's a difficult way to stay motivated. It can it can neg you out very quickly because they're so far away and they're so unachievable sometimes. And even if they're achievable, they're still so far away. So for me, I think motivation comes with an association of two things. Number one, loving the industry and the product that you sell and being really into that. And number two, having goals that are established over very short periods of time mm -hmm. that leads to giving you um, some some pleasure when you achieve them. So what I tell everyone to do is only ever think of 90 days, think of a goal over 90 days, break that down into one month goals. Then you'll see, divide that by four, you've got four weeks, divide that by five, you've got five days. Right now you know what you need to do each day in terms of the result. Then take the focus on what is the action I need to take to get the result. When you're clear on what the action is, then you have your blueprint. All you need to do then is repeat that action every day for 30 days and you will achieve that goal. Now, if you repeat that action every day, then by the end of that month, you'll give yourself something to celebrate. Also, 30 days is not so far away, so you can see a finish line. And if you give yourself something to celebrate after 30 days, then it will install more confidence and self-belief in you and will increase your motivation. But you can't do it unless you understand data. You need to know the actual actions you need to take to get the desired outcome each day. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that you analyze data to know what actions are required. And what you'll find is that most actions you need to take to achieve the outcome only take a couple of hours a day. They don't take all day, hmm. okay, if you, if you understand it in detail. And so hmm. for me, it's making sure you know what you want your outcome to be, you know what actions you've got to take, you get up every morning and you, you've got your to-do list of things to do and then reverse your to-do list. So what we typically do with our list of actions we need to take is we write the things down we like to do first. What you do, and that's very natural for most of us. So all I'll ask you to do is to start from the bottom of the list once you've written it and start with the worst things first because then everything you do during the course of the day just keeps getting better. Yes. And again, that installs more confidence in you. Awesome. Now, one more of your, one more of your books, self-belief. That's, that's a big thing, I think, for salespeople. Um, you know, you can't sell something unless you believe in it and you can't sell yourself unless you believe in yourself. So what's, what's the trick to self-belief confidence? You know, I, I really believe, like really believe that, that the education system has messed up big time. Hmm. And I believe it teaches stuff that isn't relevant and it doesn't hmm. teach stuff that's really relevant. And I don't mean just because of the internet and social media age. I mean in life. Hmm. My daughters are both at university. When they leave university, the first thing they're going to do is apply for jobs. They're going to go for job interviews and they're probably going to get rejected. Hmm. When they get rejected, What's going to happen is that they're going to question themselves, they doubt themselves, their self-esteem may go down and, and, and they'll be less enthusiastic. Yeah. Who's teaching them how to sell themselves? Because that's the first thing you need to learn. And my, my kids have got to go out there and they've got to learn how to sell themselves. So why don't we teach that at school, college, university, how you sell yourself? Yeah. And then when you think about every business on this planet, it's selling something. And because every business is selling something, there is always going to be people that work in that business that have to bring revenue through the doors. And those people are the backbone of the business, because if you don't got revenue coming through the doors, you don't have a business. Mm. You know, you look at Facebook and say, well, that's a tech business. No, it's not. It's an advertising platform. Mm. That's what Facebook is. They sell adverts. That's what Facebook do. That's how they make their money. They, they sell money, adverts. Yeah. So, so every business is, is trying to sell something. And so 
when it comes to self-belief, I, I just wish that people had been taught to sell themselves much younger. Um, so they have more confidence and more belief in, you know, their own ability to become something. I don't really need to care about an oxbow lake, okay, or the sediment that li lives in XYZ, <laughs> you know, riverbed. Yeah. And I don't, do I really need to know the name of Henry VIII's, all of his wives? I don't really need to know it. Do I need to know when the Aboriginal people, you know, uh, had their mistreatment from the Australian? I mean, all that stuff, I don't, it's not relevant to my business. No. Of course, there's importance in learning stuff, but why are we giving more importance to that than we're giving to actual life skills that you really mm. need? And so most people get into sales either because they've got bad qualifications or someone told them they could get rich quick. Mm. Okay. That's, that's so true. That's so true. That's it. And that's how I got into sales for goodness sake. Me too. <laughs> um, but, yeah. but fortunately for me, I was trained really well. And one of the things I was taught to do very early on in my career was to learn how to deal with rejection. And I remember the first day my boss said to me, he said, you're going to make 100 cold calls today. Do me a favor and go and find 99 people to say no. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. He's like, you need 99 no's. When you've got 99 no's, come and see me. And so uh, Julie made these phone calls. I was getting told to F off and B off or whatever it may be. Not interested was the nicest thing anybody said. And after I made those calls, I went to my boss and said, I've got 99 people said no. He's like, brilliant, awesome. High fived me. He said, right, excellent stuff. Go do it again tomorrow. And I was like, you're mad. <laughs> anyway, what he was teaching me to do was to understand that um, rejection is part of the game. And he said to me, look, after 99 no's, you're going to find a yes, but you won't get a yes until you've earned it. That's why you've got to go through the no's to earn the yes. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden the penny drops. I'm like, oh, I need the no's. I need the rejection to get the yeses. Got it. So then after that, every phone call that I was making when I was getting rejection, when I was getting no, fine by me, it's mm -hmm. only leading me closer to the yes. Mm -hmm. And so I became very confident around searching for no's, whereas a lot of people in sales aren't. You know, they fear rejection. They fear the telephone. They fear, you know, being in a situation that may be confrontational or someone gives them an objection. And so I think it's really important to, to understand the kind of training that you're getting around this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it, I think if you if you immerse yourself in education around your subject, it will create self-belief. Mm -hmm. If you immerse yourself and become an expert in the area, the city, whatever it is, the marketplace you work in in real estate, and you really know it, and I mean inside out, upside down, back to front, it will create self-belief. If you understand that there's rejection involved in success, then it will create self-belief because it will dispel some of those feelings that you might get that will impact upon your own belief in yourself. Mm, absolutely. Sounds like you've had amazing training. That's that's very unusual for um, real estate, you know, real estate officers are, are, are very poorly trained to, you know, as a general rule. But anyway, so it. so can anyone be great in sales? OK, well, I believe yes. And so I think that the, the stereotypical image of a salesperson is the gregarious, larger than life character where I know from my own experience that some of the best salespeople I've ever met are shy, quiet, introverted people. But what's important to remember about sales is that sales is a skill. All it is is a skill, like a lawyer, a doctor, whatever it may be, you're learning skills. And everyone, if they learn them and cares to apply them, can use those skills effectively in business. And so there's a lot of people that say, well, I'm naturally not a salesman. No, 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 no. Okay. You've been in negotiations, you've been in contract talks and stuff like that. And you've dealt with those. Well, that's selling. Okay. If you've had to raise money for your business, either through external investment or from the bank, you're selling. And so always when we look at business, there's selling being in, 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 encompassed in every aspect of what we do. And so we can learn the skills if we want to. The reason people fail at sales is they don't want to learn the skills mm. or they're cocky and they're arrogant. And there's many people in sales that think their shit doesn't stink. And so they don't open themselves up to learning to be better. And that's mm. why most people in sales either fail or live in a world of mediocrity mm. because they don't have the desire to learn to be effective and learn the actual skills that will make a difference. Okay, so do you believe in, say, the personality profiles, say the disc profiles and all that sort of thing? Like, would you ever do something like that before hiring someone to see what their thought processes? Yeah. Everybody, everybody employed by any business that I own has a disc profile done beforehand. Oh, awesome. Okay. And so is there anybody that you don't suggest going to sales out of the disc profile? 
uh, of course, through a disc profile, there'll be people that are less suited to it and more mm-hmm. suited to other things. You know, I'm less suited to being an accountant. But if, well, I, had to, yeah. if I had to be an accountant, I would be one. Mm-hmm. I'm less suited to being a, you know, a programmer, a coder. But if I really mm-hmm. wanted to be a coder, I could mm-hmm. learn the skills. Mm-hmm. And so, okay. you know, people, in my opinion, people just aren't naturally salespeople. You know, the different people buy from different people. Some people, mm-hmm. some women like mm-hmm. to buy from women. Some women like to buy from men. Some women like to buy from women that are like them. Some women like to buy from women, you know, that are not like them. You know, so, so it's different. What you have to do as a, a professional salesperson is understand not everyone's going to buy from you all of the time, but there are people that actually really like your personality, really like your characteristics. And if you know your subject, okay, i.e. the real estate market, plus you know how to sell and you're not some nonsense. I've been out on a few viewings and I've picked, made a few phone calls. And so that's me, a real estate broker type, then you'll create success. I think if you really want to help people too, it shines through rather than just being ah. a salesperson. Yeah. All, All right. So, so these questions I get asked a lot with from real estate agents. So we've got three more questions. So how do you qualify a buyer without sounding like you're interrogating them? Like, so, you know, have you got finance and all that sort of thing? Like that's something I think salespeople find very difficult. So what would you suggest for that? So the first thing that you have to do with everybody is build a, a decent level of rapport. And again, mm-hmm. I've watched people do this time and time again, very badly. Rapport is broken down into to essentially a 15 minute conversation where you ask questions and you learn about their work, their social life and their family. That, that's what you do when you build rapport and you ask five minutes of questions on each of those three areas mm-hmm. to really get a good understanding of the person that you're talking to, what their reasons are, what their background is, you know, what their interests are. So by, by building a good level of rapport, when it comes then to qualifying them, okay, what you're going to have is an, an understanding because if you build a good level of rapport, you build a little bit of trust, a little bit of credibility and everyone calms down and is a bit more comfortable. Mm-hmm. And when everyone's a bit more comfortable, then you can quite simply ask these questions, but get ask for permission first you know a lot of the time people don't ask for permission now in order for me to do my job effectively with you today there's a few questions i'm going to need to ask now some of them are easy to answer some of them may require you to think a little bit but i can do a really good job for you if okay i ask these questions would you mind if i go ahead then seek permission they will say yes and guess what you can ask those questions very easily what i find is that people try and qualify buyers on the telephone in, in, in a five minute conversation, what's your budget? How many bedrooms do you want? You know, and you know, what, what, you know, what, what's, what, what zip code do you want to live in? And it's like, mm. that, that's not selling. That, that's, mm. that's burning leads, that is. Mm, yeah. Okay, so how do you close the buyer on a product without sounding pushy? Or, 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 or close, close on the, the salesperson themselves for a listing? So give me the, give me give me an example, please, so I can answer the question. Um, well, just just say a real estate salesperson going in for a listing presentation. So how do they close somebody without being pushy? A buyers looked at a house. How do they close them to to proceed to buy the house without being pushy? Okay, so there's there, there's two words here that I think are confused, and pushy is one of them, and it's confused with desperate. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I think that I don't think pushy is bad. I think people need to be pushed sometimes. If it's I the think, right thing for them. Yeah. I think if it's the right thing, I think you need yeah. to get people moving. And so mm. you shouldn't have fear of doing that. You should have fear of having, I'm desperate and I need this cell <laughs> written across your forehead. Um, <laughs> because, because like a dog can smell fear, so can a, so can a, a prospect smell a salesperson. So if it's the right thing for somebody to do, you know, they've, they've looked at 10 units and they're, this, this is the, actually the very best unit for them, then you've got to literally, you know, put, put them in a position where they make a decision. Because when you give people lots of choices when they look at houses, it's really hard to decide hmm. because there'll be pros and cons for maybe two or three of them. And so then it becomes a difficult decision to decide. But if you chaperone people along, you know, to the, this is your list of requirements, House A does this, house B does this, but it doesn't do this. House C does this, but it doesn't do that. So we can see that house A is the best house for you. Hmm. Would you agree? They're going to say yes. Excellent. So this is the right house for you. Okay. And we can get it for the right price. Should we go ahead and put, it, and put a, an offer in? Hmm. Just ask the question, you know, 
always go back and reconfirm what they've said to you. This is what you want. Okay, they, they've told you what they want. Go back and confirm. This is what you're looking for. Okay, yeah. is this still the case? Yes. Okay, let's go and look at some properties. Now we've seen them. Is this still the case? Yeah. Which one's the best one? Oh, we're not so sure. This one. Okay, let's just go through it. So it's got the ensuite bathroom. It's got the patio. It's got the balcony upstairs. It's got the swimming pool. It's got this. It's got that. Does the job exactly the way that you described you want it to do. It's on the right street, in the right area with the parking. So... Any reason why we wouldn't go ahead? Mm. Oh, well, you know, I don't know if I can fit it in my budget. Well, you told me your budget was 350. This is 349. I'll make an offer for you under 349. Maybe we can get it in the current market at 339, let's say. We can always try, can't we? So it's in within budget. Any reason that you wouldn't go ahead? Mm. That's not that's not being pushy. That's being precise. Mm. It's okay. also it's also diagnosing and then pointing out that exactly what they wanted is what you're showing them. Yeah, you're reconfirming. <laughs> All right, awesome. And how do you follow up without being a pest? The moment you leave it to somebody um, to call you back is the moment you've lost control. Mm. So you have to be in charge of the follow-up and you have to be clear with the prospect how that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that is before you go do any viewings. Okay, make it clear what the terms of business are. This is what I'm going to do. These are the stages we're going to follow. This is the process. Do you have any questions around that? No, excellent stuff. So once we've seen the final property, <clears throat> we'll meet and make a decision. We'll get that meeting booked in. This is the process we're going to take. If you've got any objections to that? Oh, you know, I might not be able to make it. I've got to travel. I'm out of town. No problem at all. But let's not bother doing the viewings until we're in a situation where you're not out of town. Let's make sure that we're precise and concise, saves your time, saves my time, everybody wins and it's effective. Does that make sense to you? Or do you have any questions? So keep going down that path over and over again of letting them understand that this is business as well as investment. You're trying to do something that's gonna help them create more value, more worth in the future, plus create beautiful memories and bring their family up in. Okay, but they've got to understand that you're a business person too. And business, you know, most people respect that. It's there's a lot of salespeople fear being that kind of person because they fear, you know, creating an objection. But if you deal with it at the beginning of the process, then you don't create the objection further down the road. Mm, exactly. Well, thank you so much for your time today. So as I said, I've got the links in uh, there for your, um, your podcast, the Spencer Lodge podca podcast and Make It Happen University. So that's your online program uh, that sounds well, you go to, can go to spencerlodge.tv. You'll find it there. Okay, yeah, I've got the link for that there. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much for your time today. You've got to race off to an appointment now, don't you? So, yeah, all right. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. That was amazing. And I'm going to get better with my Facebook Lives and all that sort of no stuff. No worries. I'll tell you what, I'll find a YouTube video for you to teach you how to do it, or maybe I'll get one of my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do that. It's just doing it quickly. That's all. It's like you're no, under pressure. I, I'm exactly the same. When you put me under pressure like that with technology, yeah. all of a sudden my mind goes, Bleh. I know, I know. It's like, I can't. It's like a deer in the headlights. I can't do it. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> all right, we'll get better. Nice right. talking. Nice you to see too. you. Lovely yeah. to meet you. you. Thank you. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Bye.